So thank you everybody once again and lovely to see some new faces. Every time I come there's a few new faces coming to the, the BSV. So welcome and please come when you can on a Sunday. There's many wonderful teachers and teachings that are offered. Today I would like to, I will use that just to read something afterwards. Thank you. Technology is amazing. I um, finally my old phone really had had enough and um, so I had to get a new one and now I have one that I can scribble on the, the screen. So I was very tempted the other day when I heard a, a very interesting documentary that seem to have a lot of references from a totally different perspective to what I have learnt in Zen. So I want to read from this a little later in the talk. But the talk I would like to offer today, perhaps a little bit more of a Zen talk. We haven't had many Zen talks from me, but a little bit more in this way. So if you don't seem to understand, not to worry. It's probably all the better <laughs> from a Zen perspective. We can look back over this year and we're coming to that time where we start to reflect on what it is we have uh, done in our life. Maybe we're looking at achievements or just in general, you know, our, our growth has a person as a partner or a child or a parent. And I think it's very important to reflect as you come towards the end of the year on who we are right now. Because everything that we have discovered, undertaken, connected and communicated with and with whom are here in us right now. Yesterday I gave a talk. We have had this um, series of Saturday afternoon meditations and talks. And I gave a talk which I want to share some of this talk today, it always is different because I can't really remember what I talked about yesterday, but <laughs> thankfully. But it was to do with what we call in the, the Zen Buddhism non-dual. And I've reflected on this a lot. The non-dual perspective, what are we talking about? From the Buddha talked about the extremes of perspective, the extremes of connecting to what is as, you know, a wrong view and what is not as a wrong view of nihilism. And then there is this view of neither is or is, is not. It's a view of uh, um, a negotiating what is and what is not, which is more what we do through our meditation and contemplation and our Buddhist investigation. But that view in itself is not enough. It is not a clear view. So when we are looking into this perspective of the non-dual, what are we talking about? All my memories of this year are dual. They're not the actual experience. They live in this moment of my thought. But a thought in itself is a duality. It has its object of recall and, and um, 
a subject and an object, a you and a me and a this and a that and a yesterday and today and he and them and all the rest of it. We're always in this flux of opposing, judging ideas. What is good against what is not. And there's always this me in it. There's always this self-view in it. And I've often pondered in my, when I'm out of meditation, what happens in those moments where I let go of that? And letting go is a very profound, not only word, but more so experience. Because that is what we are doing in this practice. We're letting go. But when we are sitting, and yesterday we are sitting, and this has happened in the four sessions, at some point when the group is unified and me and my thoughts and my feelings and this place in regard to me fall away, there is a sort of a few moments of a, a group stillness, you might say, or a profound stillness that floods the room. And out of that, there is always a shattering noise. For two, two consecutive weeks, there was a mass of wind and thunder and clatter. And we all sort of, you know, for a moment, came out of our samadhi and listen to that. And then on two other occasions there was once kookaburras who took off in a, a great roar of cry, of laughter, in the middle, right in the middle. And yesterday there was this, this solitary parrot who sang a song. Now this parrot I'm not sure if he's a half half breed, <laughs> a half breed parrot. I, I'm sure there are. But at one point, I noticed a parrot singing. It was quite a beautiful song, and he was teaching the other parrots how to do it, because he thought if he sang a beautiful song, I would feed him more, or feed him at least. And we're sitting here, and out of that clarity, this parrot sang his full song. And I'm talking about a Rosello who normally squawks and, you know, fights and makes pretty awful noises. And it was so beautiful, it was so clear. Each of the syllable sounds appeared in my conscious attention, in my awareness in fullness. And after this, I reflected, it is this awareness that we all experience, whether we recognize it or not. You're all at the moment focused here in attention, in awareness, with open hearts and open minds. And in this awareness, nothing else about me is present. Somehow, those divisions, those expectations, Those hopes and fears are not present. I'm just with what is in this moment. All of you throughout the day have moments of total open, non-dual awareness. It is the foundation 
of our minds. It only grows when we do more practice or we allow ourselves to let go more. It, of its nature, it grows. I mean, the, the, the capacity of its power grows. It's never, it's the only constant that we have. It's the only true existence, if you want to put a word to it, that we have. In the, uh, in the teachings of Buddhism where we, I uh, see a friend had a baby. <laughs> Someone I haven't seen for a while has brought his baby to the talk. Beautiful. The Buddha talks about nothing as a stable, constant anything. But that is in the realm of what is. In the realm that we, we tend to think we exist in. In the realm of our senses. In the realm of our thoughts, our ideas. In the realm of you and me. But the actual realm, the actual, sorry, not realm, non-realm, the actual full, open space of awareness where everything exists in its place, in its moment of time, precious moment of time, fleeting moment of time, unperceived as something other, so it actually falls out of time. It can't exist in time, actually, because time doesn't exist there. But in our afterthought of it, in our cognition of it, we place it in this. But when I was coming down the mountain this morning, and it's interesting when you have a little insight into something that stays with you for a while and I'm coming down and I was able to just be with the spaciousness of this attention, this awareness. And in that everything comes in but I'm in a car moving down, moving forward. So it's even more, you know, when you're, you're sitting in meditation, everything seems to be still. But when you're driving and you have this open, unobstructed awareness, everything just flows. And there's a wonderful experience that comes with these times or periods where we can just be in this awareness is a sense of everything is okay. Everything is full. Everything is as it should be. And most of the time it's not. Most of the time. If we look back on our year, we're thinking, oh, you know, this was great and that worked well if we're in that positive state of thinking. And if we're not in that positive state of thinking, we're looking back at all the things that didn't work. Or they said this, or they think of me in that way, or... My boss doesn't really respect me. We think of it in that light. But if you can realize that these are all constructs of our thoughts, our ideas, our mind, they are not the actual 
thing in itself. They're not the actual experience in itself. Hmm. I'll read from this. These are the words of a man. You know, I just jotted them down with these fancy new, new things. You can take out a little pin here. And I discovered you can write notes on it. Put your pin back and it's all saved in there. So I was listening to this talk, which is um, by a photographer. I might have to put my finger on there to keep it in place. It's by a photographer of surfing. It's a very dangerous sport and he's a very expert person at it. Not a Buddhist, not a traditional meditator, but he says things that are very useful for us. Because as many artists, artisans, experts, scientists, experts in their fields, when they are dedicated to what they are doing, to what we are doing in our life, Many hours of this awareness grows in our life. But it grows along with a very clear intention of what we want as an outcome. It may not be clear earlier in life, but then you have a little taste of what that outcome may be. What the fruit of my perseverance and my study and my capacity may be. And then you're very energized to go for it. And he says, a moment in time, that's what it's called, one shot, one shot in a life living in this moment. And we need to just do it. Don't dream about it. Remember, he doesn't even use I. He just says, remember, it's just shooting moments. Shooting moments. With his camera, of course, but... Just shooting moments. We are just shooting. We're just experiencing moments. Compare, compare that split second in time with one shot in life. Having your moment starts years before all conditions line up to shoot. Challenging your feelings of it, sorry, challenge your feelings surrounding it, not the thing in itself. So challenging, you know, what are these emotions? What are these thoughts that are holding me back? So here he is, he's very focused. And these were different little different captions at different times in what he was doing. And he says, alone. Alone is the sound in the feeling of life. To be alone in that moment where you're experiencing this feeling as it is. There's nothing else. I'm alone in that, in that moment. What are you waiting to achieve? And what are you doing right now? It says space impacts the zone. This, when the attention and the awareness is very present, very pervading. It's like the space contracts into this 
focus into this singular activity. It's like the air is sucked out of a room. We still have this space. But if we suck this air out, we will all know about it. Our attention will be very focused. So when he is in us, we have to remember, he's talking about in the moment where massive waves, he's taken a little boat in to shoot inside these great big waves that are thundering over him, thundering over the surfers, sometimes killing them. He's saved lives in his work. But he's talking about that condition that makes, forces you to be very present and very precise. But all the time he has got one intention. He knows what picture he wants and he's always looking for that condition. So he has a goal, he has an intention. But within that, we have a goal. We, we wish to be liberated. We have an intention. We develop the practices, the, the Buddha's teachings to help us guide there. We develop the parami, we develop the precept, we develop the techniques of meditation. Because when you come close to liberation, just as in the time of the Buddha, everything impacts on you. The ego doesn't want to let go that easy. It will guise many faces, many facets, many conditions of recall. And you have to have the power to deal with that. He says, you must deal with it and seize the power and its conditions. So you have to be with that power and those conditions that could take my life, in his case, in every moment. Not the what if. Not the what if. Not what if I... Gosh, I always recall a teacher, a very great monk, very serious monk, said to me once, I missed that moment. He said, I worked very hard as a young monk. I practiced very hard. And he said, I came to it and I knew I was facing it. And somehow I couldn't take that. I, I didn't have it in me to take that extra step. To completely penetrate and enter into it might sound abstract, don't worry. As I said, it's all Zen talk and it doesn't mean anything. So bringing back, bring back to the living in the now. Come back to the living in the now is the food we need to experience this. It's a food that feeds us to be right here and with it all, with that very, very vast open mind that can take it all in. The good, the bad, the difficulty, the sorrow, the addictions, the loneliness, the hate we feel for ourselves. We can be with it all because those conditions and their appearing faces, those appearing facets of ourself are not real. They're not the real you. Being with that feeling of how shall you compare to what is going on around you. When 
you're in the middle of something so profound. We're very insignificant. I've talked about that in the bushfires. That sense of total insignificance of me in that chaos and catastrophe. And we tend to see it in disaster. But actually, it's always there. It's always there. As to the beauty and the bliss. Take up the challenge as we are dealing with death. You know, take it up. Death is always here, right now. If you deal with it now, you have no worries when it really knocks on the door. Every breath we breathe in, we're alive. Wow. Magic. And when we breathe out fully, that's gone. Wow. What next? The breath that we breathe out fully and we don't breathe in another. That we call death. Or the doorstep of death. But again, it is only this constructed reality that is dying. Your attention will continue. Memory will continue. The seeds of what you've done will continue. Even though they will develop with fabrication and with view and with the unreal. Hold down in the emptiness, you have to be positive. It says, hold down in your emptiness, which you have. You have that capacity to be positive. I'm not sure if I've written positive or passive. <laughs> Sometimes the writing is incredibly erratic. And then also he says, throw away a memory. In developing it, and it throw away any memories that you're developing and just study with each breath. It's almost, this is like a Zen poem, you know, that I would have read in China. It's incredible. Yep. Throw away. I'm going to send it to him because I'm sure he's not thought about it. To end, take time away and refuel. Let's take time and retreat. And the other was to end, to do with the former, take away each breath to end. Take time away to refuel and retreat and be about and learn about being a better person, a better partner, a better parent, a better friend. So when we take time to reflect on our life, we take time to reflect on what we've done in this past year, we can reflect on what has been useful in supporting relationships so we are in this reality, in this world. We are living in it. But when we take time to understand it, we grow and we learn and we're in less judgment of it and less fear of it. This last week I had, uh, as I always have every week, a lot of things happening in my world, but, you know, they're usually about seeing the sick, aging, dying and addicted. <laughs> and so I had a, um, a young man who came who has a very, you know, from age of 18, 
solid, serious addiction to alcohol and then other things that come into the play. An eloquent, well-spoken, well-educated man, child psychologist, maybe one of you, <laughs> and still we had a discussion. He he's, likes to meditate, he's tried, but every time something comes up, I said, you have a choice. And he, he seems to choose the side. That might seem an easy escape in that moment, but there's a lot of consequences that come with it. So we had a discussion about, well, what choices now? I said, I don't think coming to meditation every week is, you know, it's part of what you're building up around you to continue. You know, you're building up your substance. You're limiting it because you don't have the finances to completely go out and you're not working at the moment, so you're limited. But you've got your social community, which is mostly your addicted friends. You've got a few other people, another good friend who will have him for the weekend. And then you're starting to find other outlets, but you're not actually doing some necessary things to change. So I suggested, have you tried rehab? Or well, when I was 18. So I said, maybe it's a good time to have a think about that and talk to a counsellor. So we had this very, very sort of long but light conversation in the beginning, and then it started to get serious because the buts started to come in. Oh, yes, well, I've, I've applied for a job, but if I get a job and I get money, then, of course, I'll be binging again. I said, well, the job won't last long. Is it good to have the job now? So by putting it back on the person, you give them the choices. I said, you have the choices. And in the end, I knew he, he had an appointment with a counsellor and a possible appointment for employment. And after he left, I thought, well, let's hope he takes the appointment with the counsellor because I've shared how he can proceed from that. Then you can come back to meditation. Then you can stay in a monastery. Then you can start to move forward and get the strength and confidence to grow. He chose to take the job. And what will be in the back of the mind is the alcohol talking the addiction talking, the delusion talking, the confusion talking. We are all like that. Maybe not addicted to that extent on that, in that issue, but we all have these choices and over and over and over we make the choice to react in a certain way. That's offensive, aggressive, painful or speak in a certain way that's unwholesome. Even though the Buddha gives us all this, lays it out very clearly, the way to proceed, we have the choice to make a step in that direction or not. And he, this fellow says, actually when you're really in it, you don't have any choice. You have to, to get that in this case, the shot, the one capacity to get that picture, you have to work very, very hard and over a very long period of time. So anyone in this room who has addiction, you have to work very, very hard and over a long period of time, step by step, with support. And it's so amazing, as soon as you take that, make that right choice, something interesting happens. The world of positive choices start to open up. The world of possibility starts to open. And you can move very quickly. When you nail it, he says, it is is the whole, you've nailed the whole, you've got the whole thing.
and slowly behind is the picture. So just behind, once you've got this, just behind that moment, you've got what it is. The possibility to awaken. The possibility to take that opportunity. That shot in this case. You've got the picture. And I've got effort in a big <laughs> something under there. Nothing but effort is required. Nothing but our application. Well, in Buddhism we have a few more things that support effort. Because effort takes a lot, or require, requires a lot of our moral foundation, our generosity, our patience. These, and then meditation, clarity, all these will fuel and fuel your right effort. But he says, nothing but effort is needed in this moment in time. All that there is, is a moment in time. Mm. So this is just scribbling on my screen. So between the, the, the pictures of him doing what he does, and his words, you know, because things are going on. I just scribbled that down. I thought it is like a Zen poem. It, it has a lot of depth, a lot of meaning in there. And so to tie this together and come back to the point in the non-dual, in the place of what we are saying is an omdul practice. It didn't mean that at that time there was nothing else happening for the monks who had developed this idea. No, all the practices were there. All the cultivation was there. But the perception of what we think is a reality against what we experience from the practices of emptiness. Is a place where those two are embraced as one. <coughs> it's not opposing what is and it's not grasping what is. It's not rejecting and it's not existing in being attached to, you know, states of, of nothingness, which is, you know, very deep states of meditation. What it is, is the awareness where these play out. The awareness of the mind that is moving. The awareness of the mind that is grasping. The awareness of the mind or this idea of self that is in any way separate. And as he said, you know, we build our conditions in life in a more positive, in a more clear directive way, like he was having to learn a lot of skills so he could get in to get that shot and he eventually gets it once in a million you know, opportunity but because he is so well trained and so well developed in his perception and so daring, so fearless, he could get in there and take a shot, a once in a lifetime shot as any artist specifically photographers, will share that they experience. But I would say also from meditators. And after that old monk told me when I was very young, you have to work very hard to have that strength 
that fearlessness, that conviction to be right here, right now with all the conditions that are going to bombard you. All the me's that are going to say, look at this, I'm this, I want this. All those conditions. The Buddha talked about it as Mara's. And he talks about when he's about to be enlightened, Mara comes with all his daughters and rushes in and tries every trick in the book to seduce the Buddha. But the Buddha, he knew what his mind was capable of. He knew his mind is very capable of creating all of that and being very attracted to all of that at certain points of his life. So that conditioning was already built into him. You know, I may not, if I'm sitting and coming to that final point of liberation, I might not, may not see Mara and his daughters like that. They may not come to me at all. <laughs> I very much doubt they will. But there will be, and I've only had tastes of this, there will be other incredibly seductive, challenging mental states that will frighten and uh, project and deny whatever it is that's going on in the mind. That will be very powerful. You know, you can be sitting on this, it's like a mountain cliff, the peak of a mountain, as if the mind is just poised there, just balanced there. In um, our tradition, we don't put as much emphasis on the need to develop the samadhi per se, but we, we develop the, the insight and in that samadhi develops. And you can be just poised in that moment. Nothing's, nothing's taking your attention away. And then something very, very <laughs> subtle, seductive, whatever it is, a sound, something of distinction takes you in and you're gone for another 10, 15 years. <laughs> I'm going to India with Liv and a number of people from the BSB and from Malaysia, gosh, a trip of my lifetime. And it's, uh, you know, is a great practice element in this. This, this. If you're going to do a pilgrimage, do one with a teacher who's going to take you along and, you know, guide you in the spiritual, the story and, and in meditation. And uh, so this trip is like this. And then I'm thinking, well, it, I'm, I wasn't thinking actually. It's happened quite in a quite a natural way because of the side of Buddhism I practice, which has this, what we call the Bodhisattva side. And there's always got to be, you know, well, it can't just be about me, you know, there's part of my mind, you know. <laughs> but then comes a telephone call, and I said to these two nuns who do a lot of work in, in India, and I've sponsored two of their girls in the school, I said, oh, I'm going to India. And they said, oh, wonderful, where are you going? And I said, you know, the four Buddhist sites, and they said, well, you're going to go to near where your, your girls are, where the school is, in Saranath. It's only five minutes from Saranath in a car. And I thought, oh, they said, oh, we hope you can go and talk to the kids, you know, go and say hello. And I said, I'd love to. And so I looked at our schedule, and I thought, oh, yes, I could probably, you know, take an hour out. She said, don't make it too long, because the kids have to walk you know, some of the little ones have to walk, you know, three or four kilometres. And, I, you know, suddenly my mind is going, three or four kilometres. And she said, don't be fooled. They'll all come in their very best dress clothes. And I know I've seen pictures of their homes, their dirt floors and, you know, concrete walls. 
So I said, well, how many, do they have bikes? And she said, some do. And I said, well, how many need bikes? And she, so she gets back in a few days and she said, oh, seven. So then I'm, you know, I thought, oh, this is a great project to try and get my little grandnephews and nieces and other little kiddies I know to do a project of, you know, supporting a child to have a bike. And so, yes, we've been collecting these little bikes for the kids, you know. And so, in my mind, there, there always has to be another little angle, you know. I don't know how many times I'm going to get to the, that peak again because I'd always be thinking, oh, wait a minute, you know, I shouldn't be up here. <laughs> so, yes, it's given me an opportunity to also um, go and see how, how some of these children live. Not that they're unhappy in their lives, they're often very happy, but you know, a little support here and there is a good thing. And um, I think it helps us also in our practice to really connect with others um, who may not have as much at this time of the year, especially Christmas. So that's another little side plug away from the, the depth of the, <laughs> the non-dual we've taken you, thrust you back into the world. But if you're going to do something, do it with kindness and compassion, but do it also with wisdom. You know, where is the need? What is the purpose? What is it we can manage and do? And you know, what is it about? If it's about me doing a good thing, well, it's going to be limited. If it's about, see, I mean, it's not difficult for me to ask you know, a dozen people would you like to support a kid to get a bike. But for a little child here who has so much, my nephews and nieces have so much. The parents said they're all getting one gift this year. <laughs> I've got to see how that goes. And they've got to give one gift. So I thought, ah, oh, maybe this is a nice way for them to connect because they're all very little with someone in another part of the world around their age who does not have so much who has to walk four kilometres to go to school, who normally would have to marry at the age of 11 or 12, but because of the school, the girls have to commit, the parents have to commit not to marry them off until after 16. So they created this school to, to do this. So, you know, I, I see this wonderful work and I see this opportunity, but rather than the adults just, you know, giving $100 here and there. The children have to work for that. They have to make it. And they have to, as a little brother and sister, have a photograph and say, this is something I'd like to offer you. So this is where we can use all aspects. We can work with the non-dual. We can work with what is. We can have moments of what is not which gives us, freezes up a little, if we have more of those moments, and we can learn to give a little bit more with wisdom, with the right intention, right motivation. It's only with that that, that relinquishing happens, that letting go happens. So good, enough. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>